Hello everybody, I am Alavis, and the SCP I will be telling you about today is SCP-701, The Hanged King's Tragedy. Let's begin. Item number SCP-701. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. All materials relating to SCP-701 are to be kept in a triple locked archive at storage site- <coughs> These items currently consist of the two currently extant copies of the 1640 Quarto, 27 copies of the 1965 Trade Paperback Edition, 10 copies of a 1971 hardcover printing, 21 floppy diskettes consisting of data seized from raids on expunged, one SVHS video cassette tape designated SCP-701-19-A, and one steel knife of unknown origin designated SCP-701-19-B. At no time are any of these items to be removed from the room. Access to the area is to be heavily monitored. Absolutely no personnel whatsoever is to be granted access to the archive without the express in-person permission of Drs. Lu <coughs> and J Description SCP-701, The Hanged King's Tragedy, is a Caroline-era revenge tragedy in five acts. Performances of the play are associated with sudden, psychotic, and suicidal behavior among both observers and participants, as well as the manifestation of a mysterious figure, classified as SCP-701-1. Historical estimates place the number of lives claimed by the play at between and over the past 300 years. Performances of the Hanged King's Tragedy do not always end with an outbreak, of the recorded performances, only 36.78% have ended in SCP-701 events. According to historical records and investigations, these outbreaks generally follow the same pattern. One to two weeks prior to event, during the dress rehearsal period, cast members will begin to spontaneously deviate from the published text of the play Rather than improvisation or gaffes associated with going off-script, said deviations will be both orderly and consistent, as if the actors were working off a new version of the script. The cast and production crew will seem unaware of any change, and if it is brought to their attention, will state that the play has run that way from the beginning. Two to three hours prior to the event. The outbreak generally occurs during opening night, or else at the production with the greatest planned attendance, generally falling within the first week after the play's opening. One to two hours before event, SCP-701-1 begins to appear on stage in the final scene of Act 1, generally in the background or to the side of the main action. It may seem to enter or exit the stage area, but does not appear to ever enter backstage or offstage area. It simply disappears when not on stage. The cast does not appear to notice or comment on SCP-701-1, at least at first. The Event SCP-701-1 appears fully on stage during the banquet scene in Act 5. Here, it will be incorporated into the action of the play as the Hanged King. The cast will either murder each other or commit suicide, sometimes using items that seem to appear spontaneously on stage. Rioting breaks out in the audience, with viewers randomly attacking anyone in front of them, regardless of prior relationship. Following the event, if any of the audience members survive the initial outbreak, they may exit the performance space, in which case they will continue to engage in random or opportunistic violence. Victims will generally require sedation or restraint in this scenario. Normal personality will begin to return roughly 24 hours after the event. Surviving victims will generally exhibit signs consistent with a traumatic experience. Some will have no recollection of the event. Others may be rendered permanently comatose or psychotic. For a typical case study of an outbreak, see Incident Report SCP-701-19-1 
an analysis of the events leading up to the last uncontained SCP-701 event in 19... <laughs> during a high school drama performance in... <laughs> For more information on the play's published text, see document SCP-701-1640-B-1. In short, SCP-701 is a self-evolving mimetic virus transmitted through unknown means through the text of the play. Dr. Lu has theorized that SCP-701 events may involve expunged. This hypothesis is consistent with a spike in <laughs> levels detected via satellite in the vicinity of the 19th incident, indicating expunged. Foundation agents are understanding orders to suppress any performance or publication of SCP-701 whenever found or detected. Despite our best efforts to the contrary, however, the play remains freely available online, sometimes under different titles. All attempts to detect or isolate the origin of these copies have failed. Suppression of the play's publication has generally been successful, with most copies of a 1971 scholarly edition destroyed before distribution. Nonetheless, Copies of the 1965 trade paperback turn up with some regularity in both college and high school libraries. Agents are to obtain or otherwise destroy these items whenever possible. History The first known publication of the Hanged King's tragedy was as a quarto dated 1640. The play's author is not listed. The publisher, one William Cook, disappeared from the historical record soon thereafter. Strangely, the text does not appear in the stationer's register. The first known SCP-701 event on record occurred in 18... <coughs> during a performance of the play in... <coughs> USA. Other significant incidents include the 19... <coughs> performance at a small theater in... <coughs> the 1964 performance at the University of... <coughs> the 19th performance at university, the first SCP-701 event successfully suppressed by the Foundation, the 19th performance by a student group in California, the 19th television adaptation by the Broadcasting Corporation, production successfully shut down by the Foundation before broadcast, and the 19th incident in Ohio, USA, Designated SCP-701-19-1 Publication History Original 1640 Quarto All known copies in Foundation custody 1733 Folio Edition Republished 1790 1813 Cambridge University Press Edition 1965 Trade Paperback Edition 1971 Hardcover Edition Agents should note that copies of the play have often been misfiled under different titles or spellings of the title. Furthermore, photocopies of the 1965 text have been found in circulation throughout college theater departments in the continental United States and in the United Kingdom. Additional, given the high probability of expunged in my mind, I again recommend that SCP-701 be upgraded to Keter class. The SCP-701 mimetic virus may very well be the forefront of an invasion scenario. Furthermore, expunged. Dr. Lu- 12371160060 Denied. None of the current information we have on SCP-701 indicates an XK-class scenario. Until we have additional data, classification will remain at Euclid. Face facts, Doctor. The cat's been long out of the bag on this one, and in this line of business, we consider ourselves lucky if we only lose a hundred or so people every ten years. 053-123-7197-060 Incident Report SCP-701-19-1 SCP Involved SCP-701 Date 19 Location Expunged Report prepared by Drs. R and J On the content of SCP-701-19-A 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 S
A is a 187 mm by 103 mm by 25 mm SVHS video cassette tape recovered by investigators from the scene of the incident, a performance of SCP-701 at <laughs> high school in <laughs> Tape was found in a destroyed consumer-grade camcorder, which was apparently recording the performance from a vantage point within the audience. It is the only surviving record of the event. Please see the SCP-701 archives for the full transcript of the recording. In order to compare the identified deviations during an SCP-701 event with the actual plot of the published text, see document SCP-701-1640-B-1. Tape begins. 3 minutes and 10 seconds, house lights go down. 5 minutes 12 seconds, curtain rises, the play begins as published with Gonzalo's coronation speech. 10 minutes 21 seconds. A possible sighting of SCP-701-1 during Isabella's ravings, an anomalous shadow not belonging to one of the cast members shows up along the back wall of the set. 10 minutes 24 seconds, shadow disappears. 23 minutes 15 seconds, first deviation from the text. Rather than the dialogue between Francisco and the courtesan, the curtain drops and comes back up on a bare stage. Antonio enters from stage right. 23 minutes 24 seconds. First indirect sighting of SCP-701-1. The shadow of a figure seems to appear on the back wall from stage right. Antonio stops in place and acts surprised. The shadow disappears. Antonio begins a long soliloquy, confirming that he now believes Isabella's story. Dr. <laughs> Note that while this soliloquy is in the style of the rest of the play and seems to be accurate Caroline-era dialogue, Antonio's speech in this scene does not exist in the original text. 24 minutes 12 seconds. Curtain drops. 24 minutes 51 seconds. Curtain rises on Francisco and the courtesan. Antonio returns. The play continues as scripted. 31 minutes 14 seconds. First direct sighting of SCP-701-1. It enters the stands at the edge of stage left towards the end of Act 2, Scene 1. 32 minutes, 17 seconds. Gonzalo's dialogue concludes as scripted with the mention of an appointment with the ambassador from Alagada. He exits stage left. SCP-701-1 seems to turn and follow him as the lights go down. 38 minutes, 13 seconds. Second sighting of SCP-701-1 during Act 3, Scene 1. It appears on the edge of stage right as Gonzalo and Pertuccio murder Sortino. The scene concludes with Gonzalo ordering his cooks to prepare the corpse as a stew. Scripts recovered from the scene indicate that this section had been cut in rehearsal. 51 minutes, 11 seconds. Third sighting of SCP-701-1 appears close to stage left as Antonio kills Isabella. 1 hour, 9 minutes, and 12 seconds. Fourth sighting, SCP-701-1 enters with Gonzalo at the beginning of Act 4, Scene 1 and follows him throughout the scene. The scene also contains two key moments. First, Gonzalo seems to nod to SCP-701-1 when he mentions the Ambassador of Alagada. This is the first time a cast member has seemed to indicate SCP-701-1's presence. Second, the scene ends with a deviation from the text. Whereas the scripted speech at the end of Act 4 Scene 1 ends with Gonzalo considering his own moral inequity, Gonzalo here seems to be more concerned that his tribute will be sufficient for the ambassador. The lights go down. 1 hour, 21 minutes, and 15 seconds. Fifth sighting. SCP-701-1 enters stage left at the end of Act 4, Scene 2, as Antonio leaves to secure a blade for his coup. Rather than exiting, Antonio stops in front of SCP-701-1, who hands him a long dagger. This is believed to be the first appearance of the item classified SCP-701-19-B. Note that there is no mention of the item in the prop list or other records maintained by the production. 
SCP-701-1 and Antonio depart the stage together. 1 hour, 32 minutes, and 41 seconds. Sixth sighting. SCP-701-1 appears on stage left as Cornari and Lodovico exit. 1 hour, 35 minutes, and 10 seconds. The lights come up. Act 5, Scene 1. The banquet scene begins as scripted. 1 hour, 40 minutes, 52 seconds. Antonio enters, bearing a piece of parchment. Here, the textual deviations begin in earnest. Rather than the parchment being Petruccio's confession as scripted, Antonio instead describes it as an invoice from the ambassador of Alagata, proving that Gonzalo owes more tribute than he intends to pay. 1 hour, 41 minutes, and 42 seconds. SCP-701-1 enters at this point from stage right. The entire cast seems to perceive it. Gonzalo stands up, curses as an aside to the audience, and runs for stage left. The rest of the cast, including Alinda and Francisco who enter from stage left, physically restrain Gonzalo and drag him back onto the stage. SCP-701-1 meanwhile moves to the center of the stage where it stands in front of Gonzalo's throne. 1 hour, 43 minutes, and 8 seconds. A noose is dropped onto the stage from above. The cast force Gonzalo into the noose as he begins to curse in Italian and in one place possibly Latin. The noose is drawn taut and the cast drops Gonzalo. He begins to asphyxiate. 1 hour, 43 minutes, and 32 seconds. Antonio speaks. With this the tribute, in full it is paid. The actor takes SCP-701-19... <laughs> Dash B, the dagger, and draws it across Gonzalo's stomach, spilling his intestines across the stage. 1 hour, 44 minutes and 4 seconds. Alinda takes the dagger from Antonio. She speaks. With this fool's blood, it is the hanged king's. She cuts Antonio's throat. 1 hour, 45 minutes and 31 seconds. Ropes drop from the roof of the stage, a noose for each cast member. The cast assembles underneath them. Alinda takes position next to SCP-701-1. 1 hour, 46 minutes, and 12 seconds. Alinda. With this, our blood, it is the Hanged Kings. The cast hanged themselves. 1 hour, 47 minutes, and 33 seconds. SCP-701-1 moves through the hanging corpses and to front center stage. 1 hour, 47 minutes, and 41 seconds. The stage lights cut out. 1 hour, 47 minutes, and 46 seconds. Sounds of screaming and physical violence around the camera. 1 hour, 48 minutes, and 22 seconds. Loud sound, most likely the camera being knocked over. 1 hour, 49 minutes, and 1 second. The camera is destroyed. Tape ends. To go along with this SCP entry, we have an additional document. And so the crows laughed. The Grand Palace of the King trembled as flames licked its surface of gold and silver. The kingdom's long-suppressed subjects had reached the king's dungeon, where he tried to hide as his guards stood defenseless against the mob. They dragged him, the once king, now deprived of his crown and throne, through the carefully polished marble floor putting rusted chains around his hands and ankles. The very chains that the king had used to imprison his opponents. They rid him of his long, gorgeous robe, using mere rags to cover his now scarred body. The old king murmured, but his mouth was soon slammed shut by the angry crowd. The riot went on, with exploited farmers and workers, and even the once loyal and lawful citizens rushing into the palace to grab their share of the treasure. The followers and servants of the king were all butchered with knives and swords, or even by heavy sticks and stones. Even the jester of the court was not spared. He was caught crying as the people put his head against the beautifully decorated palace wall. His mask lay broken on the ground, and his blood soon stained the royal carpets as the fire grew silently, taking the palace slowly apart. But the wiser men of the city did not join this parade of madness. Unlike the uneducated crowd, they knew very well what the things in the king's dungeon meant. 
not the corruption and indulgence of pleasure, but something darker, whispers and prayer to things that should not be remembered. The tomes and symbols reminded them too much of the ancient gods of Down in the Abyss. The dark red liquid in the silver cup unsettlingly resembled blood. A lion, which was once the king's pet, now reduced to mere skeleton, had carvings on it that they wished they could unsee. And they knew that the soldiers fell before the angry people not because their weapons were not sharp or their armors were poorly made, but because their bodies so weak that they weren't even able to put up a fight. The soldiers were hardly the young men in good health they were when they were recruited, as they appeared lost and confused with a broken soul, as if something had sucked their life dry over the years. So they fled, scholars grabbing their scrolls, painters taking their paintings and tools, leaving this cursed city without looking back. The cheering in the city, however, did not cease. The people celebrated their victory, throwing filthy things towards the king, picking up stones to break his fragile bones once more. Even the smallest children had come up to kick the old man, leaving him crawling in the mud. They hardly understood what this all meant, but they too laughed with the crowd. The crows gathered on the branches nearby, and they made noises harsh and shrill, as if mocking the men below. Tortured people had taken their revenge, but even those who had been the king's accomplice had joined their ranks. The criminals who had murdered tens of people stood alongside those who were too afraid to even speak ill of the court, and they all cheered and cheered. The thieves walked proudly in broad daylight, for on this one day, the only thief was the king, who stole the kingdom from its people, and everything else done was to serve justice. Innocents had died, and the ones with blood on their hands were praised heroes, but the crowd did not care. They were vultures, feasting upon the dead body of a giant, who had been weak and sinful, now a lair for things so much more filthy than he was. And the climax of the feast came when the king was taken through the long streets and out to a small hill where an old tree stood. They were going to use the gallows to hang him, but someone suggested that the king did not deserve a formal execution, but should die nameless and forgotten. So they took him here, a deserted place where the tree happened to be big and tall enough for him to be hanged. The king, who had crawled on his broken knees all the way there, hardly resembled a king anymore. Covered in dirt and rags, he was more along the lines of beggars than anything of royalty. But even as people spat at him and cursed him, nobody dared to look at him in the eyes. Even with his jaw broken, he murmured unholy words that no one wished to hear. So the crowd shouted and yelled as loud as they could, trying to hide the unsettling feeling stirring in their hearts and minds. The execution was done easily and swiftly, as it merely took a long rope around the king's neck with its end tied to a large tree branch. The king was hanged, heavy chains still on his body, for the people felt unsafe to take them off. He had struggled like every hanged man in human history, but the words slipped through his lips were unlike anything others had spoken. He did not ask for forgiveness, nor did he curse his rebellious subjects, for he knew they had already been cursed. He spoke inhuman words that came from places of dark, and then laughed and laughed until his final breath. Then there was silence, as his hands and feet finally stopped moving. There was no longer cheering, as everyone tried to get out of the place as soon as they could. Nobody wanted to look at the hanged king for a second more, as his eyes, now lifeless and wide, still seemed to be staring at them. The courage they built up when taking the palace was gone, the pride and triumph they felt now reduced to void and fear. The king was hanged, but it was as if his laughter was still echoing on this small hill. They never intended to bury him as they eventually did, for they wanted him to be exposed in the wild for crows to come and maggots to grow and his body to decay, so that the king would die humiliated. The crows did come, circling around him, but never landed. 
they just laughed and laughed with their ugly voices as if mocking the crowd once more and the lifeless look of the king was so resentful and disgusting that everyone wanted to cover this foul creature with earth, as if mere soil would help them escape from his hateful gaze. They did not make him a tomb, however, and they buried the king only shallowly as nobody was willing to stay long enough to dig a hole deep enough. Then the crowd left. They went back to the city and indulged themselves in their newly gained treasure, trying to forget what they had witnessed. On the first day, nothing had really happened except that a homeless man reported that he had heard strange noises coming from the hill where the king was hanged and buried. He also said that crows had gathered, their eyes fixed on the king's grave as if waiting for something to happen, but this was dismissed as a madman's words. On the second day, however, many residents of the city found themselves badly ill, they coughed, bled, and trembled lying on the floor as if they were bound by heavy, rusted chains. The river that flowed across the city had turned red and smelled of human blood. Those who enjoyed their new power and wealth found themselves helpless after merely one day, clutching at the gold they took from the palace and died beside it. On the third day, those who were still alive were able to move again but they stood up only to put a knife against their throats or to scream while ripping their faces off. Their blood streamed out of their houses, staining the river with red even more. All animals had fled the city except for the crows, which were now almost everywhere. They stood watching silently as the city spiraled down into madness. At the same time, the soil on top of the king's burial rustled. The crows laughed with their harsh tone as the hanged king climbed out of his grave, with chains around his hands and ankles and the rope around his neck. He was hanged as a king of men, but he came out of that place something else. His body lifeless, but he was not dead as he refused to walk that path and use souls he had and didn't have to make the bargain. The chains hit the ground, clashing against each other as the hanged king made his way back to the city. The very city now flooded with blood and watched by dark crows, where people kept screaming until they could scream no more. He moved past the streets where he was dragged along just a few days back, stepping on the blood of his former subjects. He walked slowly towards the ruins of the once magnificent palace he had built all those years ago. The treasures had been taken, and all that was left were dead bodies and broken weapons. The king moved past a broken mask which was once worn by his favorite jester, but he paid no attention. He walked towards the dungeon where a throne covered by sharp, rusted spikes was placed. The ones who had taken the palace thought it was meant for torturing and did not bother to move it. The king, leaving a blood trail behind, stepped upon the throne and placed his body through the cold metal spikes. As the spikes went through his dead body, the king trembled. He would have screamed if the rope had not rendered him breathless, for the pain was in the soul rather than his body. He was there to suffer forever, but it had been done and it was then his one and only rightful throne. For a moment there, there was silence, but then the ruins of the palace began to shake and the city started to tremble. The flames rose once more, but more of a phantom of the past and the blood in the river started to boil. The skeleton of the lion stood up and roared. The king's dungeon, where the throne was placed, the center of all these now became a hole, a hole that warped the whole kingdom inside. It turned everything inside out, making them twisted and inhuman. The space bent, time disoriented, and the city was in another place not quite there, but still where they all were. The whole city was transformed and remade. The crows had taken off and they circled the city, searching for those who were not yet dead, pecking them with their beaks until they bled out in horrifying forms. The hanged king, who is now seated in the court of his new city built upon the ruins of the old one, shall sit there forever and ever. The dead jester came up, once again wore his broken mask, and offered the king a silver cup filled with blood. 
He spoke words not quite his in an alien tone. With this, our blood, it is the hanged king's. The king took the cup, but his hand was broken and pierced by the sharp blades of the throne. The scarred hand trembled hard and was too weak to hold it. The cup then fell on the floor and the blood spilled on his new court. The crows, who had been watching, laughed again with their harsh voices and left. They left the city as the dead stood up again, bending their broken body to resemble human form. They walked the new twisted streets, putting on masks to cover their bloodied faces, and started to cheer as they did when they were alive on the day they took the palace. They paraded in the new city and started a carnival, as if the tragedy was a grand masquerade all along. They laughed and laughed until the king started to cry and scream, but his throat could not make a single sound, so he merely wept in silence. So the city was ruled forever by the hanged king, with the masks dead, celebrating and parading until they too rot. But even those who had fled the city when the king was hanged found no peace. They were haunted in waking moments and in dreams, for whispers from the twisted city had found their hidings. They dreamt of a masquerade of corrupted souls, through the long hallways of a labyrinth down to the hanged king's grand court, and when they woke up, they would shake in fear, but they could not forget what they had seen, as if the city of decay and rapture had taken roots in their mind. So they wrote dramas and poems about the cursed city, composed songs and paintings of the king. Some of them lost and forgotten, but those survived the long history will bring their viewers to the Hanged King's reach, and outside the twisted alleys of the kingdom, beyond the spiked throne of the Hanged King, the crows all laughed and fly away, but their eyes shall always be watching. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed what you heard and would like to hear more, please consider liking and subscribing. It would be greatly appreciated. Have a nice day.